The saying goes that health is wealth. But what if you are not healthy? And we're going to spend some time tonight hearing about an amazing story from Dr. Ruby Lathan. She's going to share with us her change, her trek, her pivot into a healthy lifestyle using holistic medicine. And tonight you get a sideline, you get a front row seat to hear her story. And we are going to have a good time understanding how can we take care of our bodies? How can we use a holistic approach, holistic nutrition to live the life we've always wanted? Thank you for being with us. Hang on and we're going to get started. This is Dr. Dwayne Wood. If you are new to me, I am an endocrinologist and the Wood stands for endocrinology. Here on the channel, I educate, I empower, and I encourage you to take charge of your health and your life. Avoid complications, live the life you've always wanted. We want you to create the life you've always wanted going to the next level. You have caught me on day number 13. I had to look over to my clock. Number 13 of what we're calling Vlogmas. Vlogmas every year, every December, content creators go live and they create they take time to expand improve and grow as they improve their craft improve their offering and improve what they do the benefit to us is that we get to grow we get to change and the benefit to you our audience our customers our clients our patients is that you get to see it and you sometimes you get to see it in real time as you've seen on this show. Right above me is the logo for Vlogmas. So if you see any content created out here during the month of December, I want you to go over and support them. You may not even like the content. You may not do that content. You may not listen to, you may not subscribe to that normally. But as we go through this month, we encourage you every time you see something like this on one of the content creators' websites, on their shows, on their offerings, go ahead and support them by going over and let them know that you appreciate them. To all of my colleagues who are out there who are live streaming even at this moment, uh, my hat's off to you. Thank you for what you do for the community and thank you for what you're doing during this month. All right. We have had a wonderful month so far, right? We had a great time. And if you remember, we've got, uh, we were last month or last week, we had an amazing 10 episodes and this week is no exception. Let me pull that graphic up there really quickly so that you can see where we are heading for this month, right? We've talked to Dr. Rain and Andrews. Tonight we're talking to Dr. Ruby Lathan. We've got Dr. Uh, Oriaco, Bina Oriaco. We've got India Delgado, the India Delgado. Delgado and Mr. Pastor Kirk Nugent is coming through. And then as we get to the end of the week, we've got Dr. Neil Barnard. So you do not want to miss any of the episodes. If you've not already done so, go back and make sure that you watch the other ones that we've done. There is a uh, playlist that's on the channel and then you can meet us, reach us on all of our social media platforms. Now, enough said about that. Uh, thank you guys for coming out. If you're out there, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Let's jump into it. Dr. Ruby Lathan is an engineer by training turned holistic nutritionist after she healed herself of thyroid cancer by drastically changing her lifestyle through a plant-based diet. Dr. Lathan was featured in the hit documentary, What the Health? I watched it, by the way, became vegan at the time, and the newly released documentary, They're Trying to Kill Us. She now teaches others how to re-engineer their health and live disease-free. So let's go ahead and just bring her up on the stage. Dr. Lathan, we thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> Glad to be here. Glad to be here. <laughs> Now, I'll tell you, I, I have been looking forward to, to having you on, looking forward to connecting with you after uh, years of time spent apart. Uh, and we've known each other, well, I can't tell you the last, when we met each other, but years and years ago. Yeah, way back at college, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it was many years ago. Right. Yeah. So my first question to you has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but are you ready for Christmas? Do you have all your gifts ready? Are they wrapped and they, are they under the tree? <laughs> Never ready for Christmas. Ready. I, one day that will be my crowning accomplishment to have shopped early. And and I don't actually wrap. I take everything home and then my sister wraps everything. I <laughs> love it. I love it. Hey, can, can I borrow her? Wrapper, <laughs> or I just get gift bag. I am so bad at wrapping. It's terrible. It looks like a three-year-old did it. So she's like great at it. So I just let her do it. 
Awesome, awesome. Tell her I might I might call her for her services. <laughs> right. Absolutely. All right. Well, why did you do this for me? Take a moment and just and we'll talk about your story. We'll talk about you what you're doing now, but take a moment and just introduce yourself uh to our audience. Um, sure. So um and you've already introduced me a bit, but um, as you mentioned, I'm a holistic nutritionist now. Sec- my, this is my second career. Um, I've always been a health enthusiast. So this is kind of a, a natural, um, you know, evolution of what initially, you know, started. But um, I live here in Washington, D.C., which I love. And I do a variety of things aside from being a holistic nutritionist, vegan chef. I have a food delivery, vegan food delivery service, Ruby Reds Vegan, here in the D.C. area, Virginia, Maryland area. So I stay busy. I'm always cooking or teaching or coaching uh, something, and I really love doing it. Um, and so that's 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 the short story. Obviously, I'm a, a cancer survivor, which kind of pushed me in this direction. Um, and so, so yeah, that's that's the the nutshell. All right, right, and there's a there's a lot in that nutshell yeah. <laughs> that, we, that, we, that we'll talk about and unpack. But let's uh, hop over. There's uh, Florence is here visiting, and she says, "Good evening, Dr. Wood and Dr. Lathan." Let me see if I can get her comment up on the screen. Hey, Florence, thank you for coming through. Appreciate you hanging out with us uh, for just uh, these few moments. Appreciate it. Well, so so let's let's do this. Let's jump right into it. So I guess the first question is, and you 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 are where you are now, but what did what did Ruby, what did Dr. Lathan, the young girl, want to be when she grew up? Uh, surprisingly, I wanted to be a medical doctor. <laughs> but um that kind of got derailed when I did a a visit, we did some kind of like a intern, a mini internship in high school where we could go and um, shadow some doctors and watch what they were doing. Um, and I happened to watch a surgery and I was so grossed out that I was like, I can't do that. I can't be a doctor. <laughs> I was like, I'm done. And I was like, there's no way that I could cut someone, especially in a straight line. You know how I am with, I mentioned with wrapping, right? So I, I'm like, I don't have that super steady hand. <laughs> and so I decided then I had wanted to be a doctor since I was like, you know, maybe 11 or 12. And then in high school, when I actually saw it, I was like, I can't, I can't. So um, so then I just switched to, you know, to computer science kind of near, you know, in my senior year in high school, um, you know, when Microsoft was big and, and computers were home computers. I, I feel so old now because <laughs> like, home computers were just coming out um, in terms of being in everybody's home. And we had one and I was so fascinated by it. Um, I was like, I got to I want to do computer science because I want to know how this thing works. I want to know how computers work. I've always been someone who wanted to figure out how things work. Um, And so I decided I was going to do that. I also actually wanted to once I switched from not wanting to be a medical doctor, I was like, I really wanted to do psychology Um, again because I wanted to know how the mind works. But I was like, you know, I really want to position that when I get out of four years, I can make money immediately in case I can't go to graduate school. And I know with psychology, you need a higher degree to make it work. So it was all kind of calculated based on what would be practical to make a really great living. And so I I, I decided on computer science. And so that's what I did in in undergrad at Oakwood, where I'm pretty sure that's where we connected um, at Oakwood University, Oakwood College at the time. And so started with um, computer science, loved it. Um, and then it's, an, it's a, what's great about internships is it really lets you get a window into uh, what that job would be like. And so I did an internship or two um, in computer science. And I was like, I don't want to be a programmer. I don't want to sit in a room with other people who are just drinking Cokes all day and, and, and program. So I switched to engineering um which was very interesting to me and went in that direction so i loved uh i did industrial systems engineering i had a fellowship at nasa loved that got a lot of experience and so it just kind of 
meshed from there. So it's funny that I wanted to be a medical doctor initially. That was my first love. And then here I am still helping people heal just in a different way. And, you know, that's that's been the amazing thing as I talk to people this this week, this month, that um, their skills transfer and followed them wherever they ended up. The Mm -hmm. skills that they had really came along with them. Oh, absolutely. And that was kind of a big fear, honestly, when I decided I didn't want to do engineering anymore was that, oh, you wasted all this time. You've been in school for like 10 years, you know, with undergrad, master's, PhD. That's like 10 years of life. And it was like I felt trapped, like I couldn't leave it because it would be a waste of my head. I would have wasted my time. But the thing about education is, number one, I enjoyed it. I left school. So it wasn't a waste of time. I had a good time because I loved learning. I met so many great friends. I had great experiences. I got to travel, um, you know, all the way to, to Paris to represent my work and my school. So I enjoyed school. So number one, it wasn't a waste because I had a good time doing it. So you really need to choose something that you actually love because it's never wasted. And then number two, the skills that I developed you know, in computer science and engineering are absolutely transferable. I mean, a lot of people who, um, you know, are going into law, for example, would do uh, technical undergraduates because it teaches you how to use logic and work. And so with engineering and with computer science, you definitely learn logic and how to close the loop and how to not let things slip through the crack. And if you're going to be a good programmer, you have to think of all the scenarios that are going to anticipate all the scenarios that are going to come up in order for your program to work. Otherwise, you'll end up in an endless loop or failure of the program and all of that. So when you learn how to think like that and think logically and systematically and develop a system, then that's transferable to anything and which I've seen that I've uh, been able to do. So, So learning, understanding that. And so even though it took cancer for me to kind of figure out that I was actually going to make the leap out of it, Um, but the process of where I, you know, getting to, uh, you know, where I was, I did enjoy the process. It's just once I got to the job, I was like, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Now it's funny. You, uh, you mentioned home computers. I was talking, I think it was on my show last night and I started saying something and I almost said word star. I said, you know, fire up your (laughs) word star. (laughs) And I said, oh my goodness, I am old. (laughs) <laughs> oh man, I haven't heard that in forever. <laughs> and I had to like, I was like, yeah, that's right. It's Word now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or um, yeah, what was the yeah. other one? Uh, Word Perfect. Word. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It was Word, Word, Word Perfect. Perfect. I mean, I think I read somewhere where like our generation is the first generation to grow up with know what it's like to have no computers, no cell phones, and then have all of that at the same time. So we're kind of in a unique position, you know, to right. experience the dark ages without cell phones and being tracked 24 seven. And thank God we couldn't be, because I'd have been a world of trouble in high school if I could be tracked. So I appreciate my uh, upbringing where everything was not recorded. Perfectly. Right. <laughs> you know, I was giving a talk once and, um, to some uh, some kids, and I said to them, I said, yeah, you know, when you're young, you feel like every, you know, the world is in front of you, you can take over every, anything, and you're invulnerable, but it's not like you can go into the phone booth and come out the other side. Mm-hmm. And I paused because I was, you know, waiting for them to like, and they were looking at me like, what, what, what is he talking about? <laughs> They didn't know what a phone booth, right? They didn't recognize the phone booth. <laughs> so, that's funny. Yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other story. So, okay, so so I love, uh, you know, so, so you're engineering. So you came to Oakwood, got through, and you have a master's, right? Mm-hmm. Well, bachelor's, master's, PhD mm-hmm. in engineering. Right. What was it yeah. like? You said you was yeah at Oakwood, and then I went to the University of Alabama for the master's and PhD. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and so, what was it like th- during that trek? I mean, were there classes you took that were difficult? Did you ever doubt whether you wanted to be engineer once you changed from your idea of medicine? 
what tell us that that thought process as you went into that pro, yeah, that uh, education good question um once again you know i was always a great student and kind of the teacher's pet because i was a good student and i liked being there um but what i realized um when i was doing uh especially when I went into graduate school, that I had this habit of memorizing things and not necessarily learning. And there's a big difference between the two. And I didn't realize how important that was until I got to graduate school and start taking the upper levels, mathematics and um, you know, regression analysis and all those things where you had to apply the formulas and not just memorize them like you could do in earlier calculus and things like that. So so that was the big shift for me, like, okay, I actually need to learn how to apply this and not just memorize. Because when you're young, you can just memorize rote memory. I'm great. I can regurgitate anything. Um, but when it was really the application of it, um, that, was a, that was a different thing. So I had a great time in undergrad, you know, good friends. And like I said, I was, I was a good student, loved what I was doing. Probably my challenges were, um, oddly enough, was I was afraid I couldn't do the math. <laughs> you know, when I started getting into calculus and things like that, it started getting a little tricky. Um, but, you know, I had a good conversation with my dad who was, you know, big motivator. He was like, you can do anything you want. You know, you can do this. And so I kind of got over that fear that I couldn't do something when it came to like mathematics. So I was really good in English and all those kind of things. Um, but math was something I had to work at. And if you're, and I, so I was thinking, well, if I'm going to do like engineering, how am I going to make it? Um, and so my first semester in graduate school, I had to do a, a mathematics class. What was it? Differential equations. Cause it was one class that I hadn't taken in undergrad and you had to get a B or better to get into the program. So I was stressed about that, uh, having that pressure and once I got through that, so I got a tutor, I got help, and I, I passed the class with a high B. And I was, I, that gave me the confidence that I could do this program. And so going through a uh, graduate program, one of the things I learned is you really have to work with other people because it's not just the classwork, it's relationships. So you need to know how to deal with these professors because what was different about going to Oakwood and then going to the University of Alabama, you know, go from a predominantly black school to a predominantly white school, that was a shift. Um, and I didn't get all the warm receptions from some of the professors and um, things like that. And so unfortunately I dealt with the racism that comes along with, you know, being uh, a minority in a predominantly white institution. And so, but the thing about that is I felt so confident in my capabilities that I was not going to let them discourage me from what I was trying to do, especially when I got into the PhD program because I'd gone through the master's, but the intensity of the racism was much higher in the PhD program. So it kind of colored things a bit, but I was determined that nothing was going to stop me. I was like, I know my history. I know my capabilities. There's nothing you can do to make me give up at this point. I'm, I've already put in enough work. So that was, that was, you know, I still enjoyed my time at UAH, but it had its challenges for sure. Um, even through my, my um, dissertation, I had challenges that were not, did, didn't go how it went for everybody else. Um, but the good thing is I had a good network. Um, and so we studied together. So I knew I was prepared. Um, and then when I did face those challenges, I did have a network of professors and people who I could go to to speak up for me because, um, you know, I had some folks who were trying to keep me from graduating. And I said, no, you're not. I didn't put in all this time. It's going to happen. So, so um, yeah, so it was, it was good and challenging and it was a growth experience. And I, what I will say, one of the benefits of the hostility that I faced at the University of Alabama was that I became very good at speaking because we would have um, exams that were audible exams. So you couldn't use your notes. You had to know your stuff. It was a verbal exam. And so you have to be confident in what you're doing and, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's. So I was really good at speaking because I wasn't going to be caught up and not be able to represent my work. And every time I would do like a presentation or research, I was questioned so 
harshly that I just got in the habit of making sure there were no, there's nothing you could, you know, bring up that I wasn't prepared for. And so the first time I did a talk outside of my university where I was presenting my research and I got a, a cool, friendly reception and people were actually asking me about my work, uh, how I did it as opposed to trying to prove me wrong in the questions, I was like floored. I was like, oh, this is how this is supposed to go. Um, and then the second time I presented my work and people were actually interested in what I was doing, again, not trying to invalidate my work, but curious about the work. Um, it was so refreshing. But what I learned is I became excellent at public speaking because you couldn't throw anything at me because I've thought about all the possible loopholes or errors in advance because I had to be in order to get through that school because that's how I was treated. And so it turned out to be a blessing. You know what they say, what they mean for evil turns out for your good. And so I just took that lesson from that, that I was hazed, um, but it came out for my good. Wow. Wow. That's, that's an amazing, amazing story now. So, so let, let me jump into that for a minute. So, because mm -hmm. there's somebody out there right now who's watching, who will be watching in the future and they are not quite sure about where they are either because they're not sure of the subject matter anymore. They see something they don't like in what they're doing. There's someone in their environment that makes it difficult for them and they are doubting themselves right now. What do you say to them? Um, it's okay. It's okay to doubt and it's okay to change course. I mean, it's your life. It's not, it's not a playbook. And that's kind of how I had the idea of this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to go to school, graduate, you know, get the good job, probably get married and have kids. And this is the playbook that I'm supposed to follow, dot, dot, dot. And so when it came time to kind of disrupt that a bit, it's a little scary, but you, there is no play. You get to decide whatever it is you want. So if you want to change course and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go study a year abroad. I want to do something else. I want to sit out a year, do it, do it. Especially the younger you are, make the most mistakes then. And you can make them at any age, but it's a lot easier. So it's like, don't worry about what you're supposed to do and do what feels right to you and just throw out the playbook and realize you're writing it as you go. Now, now the other thing that I'd love you for you to talk to, talk to or give a word to is, so you have a PhD in engineering. Mm -hmm. You're an African-American female mm -hmm. with a PhD in engineering. Sure. And we traditionally say, you know, girls don't do this, girls don't do this. Talk to my young ladies and, and yeah, just to talk to them for a minute. And I have to say that was one of the reasons it was hard for me to decide to leave because so many people were looking up to me because of that, because it was a male dominated field. You know, most of the people in my classes were, were men. Most of the teachers were men. I had a few female teachers, but most were, were male. So um, it was, you know, I got used to being, you know, in a male dominated field, but there, there were challenges that came with that. You know, I was questioned, I was questioned a lot, especially, um, you know, in the beginning of my career in my first job, I guess I looked pretty young. I guess I was younger, but, um, but probably looked younger than they thought I was. And, um, I had to be ready to be, <laughs> defend myself. Um, but, I was not intimidated by it. You know, it's like, it is what it is. I'm here, I'm gonna be here. Um, the main thing I would say as a woman in a male dominated field is to know that you're probably, you're definitely as good and probably better than the men because we have to do that to get the respect. So know that you're probably better. So walk in with that, walk in with that confidence. Um, you know, the other thing is I, I had to be, I would, I remember the first few times I was working with, uh, you know, we'd work with different contractors. I'm giving a presentation, a very technical presentation about, you know, algorithms and how we're doing it. And I got stopped in the middle of it. And it was an older uh, white male in the, you know, military contractor nest. Um, hold on a second. Um, 
who <laughs> he basically asked, who am I? And could I kind of like give my credentials um, to even validate why I was in the room? And so he didn't say it like that, but he was like, well, who, wait, who are you? What are you? What's your background? But it was like the oddest question because no one else had to give their like credentials. I mean, I worked for a national laboratory. You don't think they would just send the help. You know, they're sending their best. So I had to stop, run down my credentials and talk about why, you know, um, why we're presenting what we're presenting. And, and then after that, it was like the respect was given and there was nothing else to say. And then I went through the presentation. Um, things like that will happen. You will be challenged, but you know, I take it as my opportunity to shine. You can ask me what you want. You're not going to throw me. I've already gone through the, the heat of this, you know, in school. So, um, it was already there, but I would just say, have a network number one of people that you can kind of offload the emotional stuff to, um, so that you're not carrying that with you because I did carry that anger from school for a long time, for a few years after graduating, how I was, you know, treated, but I finally like let that go. And it's important to have that outlet um, and then create your own network of supporters. I mean, things are better now than, you know, the early 2000s, um, but, you know, it, sexism still exists. And, um, you know, you want to be in a, in a mode of, I don't believe in that, the, the motto that I grew up with, that we have to work twice as hard to get half the recognition. We're not killing ourselves anymore. We're just expecting the recognition and to be, uh, you know, rewarded for the work we're doing. We're not bending over backwards anymore. We're here and we deserve to be here and we don't have to prove ourselves like that, but be the best you can be um, and let your work speak for itself. I love that. Love that message. Uh, I think I'm going to clip that out and pass it around to everybody. <laughs> so, so you're in the career, mm -hmm. right? And you're doing your thing. You're doing presentations. You've got the PhD behind you. Mm -hmm. And then something happens in your life. Mm -hmm. You get a diagnosis. Right. Tell us what was going on and what was the diagnosis? Yeah. So at this point, I had left the lab because they had a technology transfer program where you could take the technology that you had been working on and start your own company with it. And so I had partnered with some uh, colleagues that we were in graduate school together, um, had an engineering firm and we partnered together to transfer some of the simulation and optimization work that I was doing to to that company and so i was and had been doing that for a couple of years but partnership wasn't optimal so you know i was i was being the workhorse doing most of the work but not getting most of the money um so i was kind of looking for a way out you know that sexism existed even among colleagues um and so i was looking kind of for a way out of it because i wasn't really enjoying it i was traveling all the time and i was like what am i going to do to kind of get out of this i have money invested i have time invested i have technology invested how am I gonna, you know, what's my exit strategy to do something I really want to do? Um, and right at that time, that's when I had just gone to the doctor. She like checked my thyroid and she's a really good doctor and thought that it felt a little bumpy and large so that we should do uh, an uh, ultrasound. We had done one like three or four years before um, and it didn't, it just looked, you know, a little bumpy. Um, but she said, let's take another one and compare. And then once we did that, saw some new nodules and, you know, more activity around some nodules. So she said, let's, you know, do the biopsy. That's why I went to the endocrinologist to, to do that. And I really, cancer was the last thing on my mind. I was like, sure, we can do the test. There's no way I have cancer. I'm pretty healthy, you know, vegetarian uh, for the most part. I don't have cancer. So when I got the call like a week later on like a work trip, I was floored, I was stunned. I wasn't ready because I hadn't even, I had forgotten I had taken the, the biopsy, honestly. And so um, I couldn't believe it. And so I asked him, you know, what are the options? And went through, you know, have surgery, we take it out, you're on the medication, boom, boom, boom. It's no big deal. Um, and then I realized, you know, I'd have to be on the medication forever. I didn't want to do that. 
And I said, well, then what about natural methods or other? He's like, I've never seen anyone healed from thyroid cancer naturally, but you can do what you want for three months and then come back and we'll do the surgery then. <laughs> so, so I said, okay. So I, uh, you know, from there, I just started researching uh, natural methods to heal cancer. Um, and I went to Uchi Pines in Alabama, you know, um, for three weeks, like within about three weeks of the diagnosis, I was there uh, really to just jump in how to use food as medicine learned a ton, uh, came back and, you know, started my own nutrition plan to, to heal myself. So, so, and you, you tell that story, I'm sure you've told it many, many, <laughs> many, many times, but, sure. but what's going through your mind when they call and say, Hey, you have thyroid cancer. I mean, it's one of the few times I did have to sit down. You know, it's like when they say you need to sit down for this. I mean, that's that's how it felt like. It was so it was such a shock. Um, and anytime you hear cancer, it's like it's it it's scary. So um, I was I was just taken aback. But you know, I had enough wherewithal to ask the questions. You know, what are the options? What am I supposed to do? Um, and he was so like matter of fact about it that immediately, you know, when he said, we'll schedule the surgery, you'll do this, you'll do that. I'm like, pause. <laughs> um, uh, we have not decided what we are going to do. You just told me I need a minute, you know, to decide. And he, basically in his mind, there's nothing to decide. You're going to do what I am telling you to do. Um, so there's nothing to decide. But there was something about the way the whole conversation went with, it was like, here's the diagnosis. Now you're going to do this. You're going to do that. And I was like, nobody's going to take charge of my life like this. Okay. First of all, pause. Like I said, let me digest this. Let me decide. Let me get a second opinion. Let me research what was going to happen to my body. We're not going to do something irreversible just because you said so. And so I've always been the, the rebel child, the you're not going to tell me what to do kind of person. Um, so when that happened, when I felt like I was about to be put into a system that was out of my control, I just had a visceral reaction of no. I was like, well, we're not, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not taking out the thought. No, it was just a no immediately. Um, so I knew I needed to start researching. And so that was my initial reaction was shock. And then, okay, what am I going to do? And then, but we're not doing this. We're going to do something else first. Wow. Wow. And so, so this evaluation, you know, so they did a biopsy, the biopsy comes back cancer. Hey, this is what we want to do. Um, no, not, this, 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 this is what we're going to do. Not, not what we yeah. want to do. This is what we're yeah. going to do. <laughs> right. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. At, yeah. at that moment, right. Mm -hmm. When, when, when you're talking with the doctor and, and there are people out there right now who are disagreeing with their physician, right? Mm -hmm. And so what's going through your mind? And as you leave that conversation, what are you thinking? I'm thinking I got to start researching. I got to figure this out. I'm thinking, um, I'm just not going to do that. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not going to die. I'm just going to, you know, I just made like a couple of decisions. Um, so I was in Alabama at the time because, you know, the job I was working, I was in New Mexico. I happened to be in Alabama for work. And I remember telling my my family, my brothers, my sister, my mom and dad, and, um, and they just started crying like I was about to die. And I was like, wait, hold up. I'm not dying. Okay. <laughs> so we don't have to cry like this. I'm going to be okay. I understand that this is shocking, but I'm not going to die. So I think, honestly, that's like the first thing you need to decide is you're not going to die. You're going to make it through this. That was number one. Um, and then I was like, I just got to start researching. So I was really anxious to get home so I could get to researching to figure out what I was going to do. Um, and that's when, you know, the Yuchi Pines came up. I said, okay, I'm going to do that. And then I still had two or three weeks to research and, and I just started 
kind of coming up with a plan. I, st- I got like second and third opinions. I started, you know, meeting with doctors, but my initial reaction was, I can't believe this. I'm so shocked. I'm stunned. I think I cried maybe twice about this in the second. I was like, I'm, I'm done crying because why am I crying? I'm not going to die. So I stopped that and I just decided that, that you know, I was going to figure it out, whatever it took. Wow. Wow. And so here we are. That was in 2007, is it? Uh-huh. 2007. Yeah. Here we are, 2022. Still okay. here. And you're still yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, let's get some music get some handcuffs for that, right? <laughs> right. So you're still here. So everybody at this moment who's watching this, they're asking the same question. What did you do? <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> so, so I would say, you know, I was probably like the typical American when it comes to nutrition in terms of what I knew. I knew you're supposed to eat vegetables and things are healthy, but I really didn't have the full scope of, of what eating healthy meant. Um, you know, I like, and how, how incredibly important food is to the healing process. I, I've told, mentioned this before in other interviews where like the night before going to Uchi Pines, I was picking out on Doritos and, and Oreos because I knew I wasn't going to have healthy or not healthy, but yummy food there. <laughs> so, and honestly, that makes zero sense when you're thinking I'm going to a place to get well, let me eat a bunch of junk food first. But that's just kind of the frame of mind of not fully yet understanding how important food is. And so so first I, I got rid of all the, the dairy products that I was eating, the processed food. Obviously, I gave up Doritos and Oreos um, and milk and cheese, which was a big thing, um, and all the processed and boxed food. So. That was number one to going from eating processed, high dairy, high processed soy to eating like fully natural um, food. So the refrigerator goes from, you know, healthy boxed microwavable dinners and the freezer being full of that to the refrigerator being full of greens and wheatgrass and tons of fruits and vegetables. So, so that was the first thing. So I went plant-based. I went, you know, from vegetarian to basically vegan. Um, I went from processed food to natural whole foods. Um, and then I, I started learning about, I learned so much about supplements and things while at UG Pines. And so, and then I started working with a naturopathic doctor um, there in Albuquerque. So I kind of you know got rid of all the junk, started taking a whole regimen of supplements, things like, um, well, I started with wheatgrass every day two ounces with um, ginger, uh, because that's, to me, juicing is very important, but it can be very time consuming. So I decided to go with the wheatgrass because you only need two ounces and it's the equivalent of drinking about, you know, of eating about five pounds of vegetables. So I did the wheatgrass every day. Then I would do teas every day, like Essiac tea, Partiarco tea, a bunch of different teas that are meant to help boost the immune system. I ate eight cloves of garlic a day. I, I would steam them, make it a little easier, eat some raw. Um, I would probably take that, the steamed one and put it on toast, like the like Ezekiel type bread um, every day. And then I would put the others in like a pesto, a nut pesto, eat a lot of salads, brown rice, um, you know, hemp seeds, chia seeds, all the seeds drinking juices like noni juice, aloe vera juice, uh, supplements like IP6, uh, Vitalzyme, which reduces inflammation in the body. It's a systemic enzyme, um, algae water, uh, you know, uh, mushroom extracts that help protect the thyroid. I did kind of some detoxing, heavy metal detoxing and bentonite clay in baths. Um, I did hydrotherapy, getting in very hot water to induce like a fever um, that will get your, uh, your T cells fighting. Um, so I pretty much did everything. I I did so many things because I was, I was just taking in information like a water hose and everything that sounded good. I was like doing, and even some stuff that sounded crazy, I was doing. So I, 
I then was getting overwhelmed because it was so much. Because every time you read a new thing, oh, this person did this and this person did that. And then I would try that for a little bit and try that. So, and the thing that kind of stopped me was that I was just feeling overwhelmed and I expected it to be gone so very quickly, like in three months when it wasn't, you know, I got a little discouraged. So I was like, maybe there's more, a different approach I need to take. But that's to answer the question, I was eating whole foods, real food, kale, cabbage, collard greens, you know, all the fruit um, and a bunch of supplements. Wow. So you went, you said a lot of things in there, by the way, (laughs) in that list that you just gave us. Yeah. We could probably do an entire show on everything that you said. Oh, sure. And that wasn't everything. It's just off the top. Well, right, right. (laughs) So as, as you think back to that time, Right. So and, and, and you said that you just want that you were just sucking up the information. Right. As as you're doing this and you're doing it and you say, well, wait a minute, this is not working. OK, I think that's a one one place for us to pause and really talk to people and and t- talk to us about the process of the naturopathic, holistic, healthy diet lifestyle right because you know we've been couch potatoes for 12 years and we want to lose weight tomorrow we have not done anything in our health and next week we want to be able to run a marathon so talk to us first of all about the process of eating healthy and lifestyle and holistic what does what tell us about that yeah so I mean, I, I <laughs> number one, you can overdo a good thing. So let's just say that. Um, I were like, for example, I'll give a real kind of funny example. When I was um, at Uchi Pines, there were, you know, we had to eat very specific things, and kiwi was one of the things I could eat. So I was like, you know, I'm just gonna do all kiwi for breakfast, and I need a lot of it because I'm hungry. So I ate like eight kiwis, but that's all I'm eating, right? Kiwi is very acidic. It's good for the body, but it can be very acidic. So after when I when I went to the bathroom the next morning after eating eight kiwis, it burned like I've never had a burning before. And I was like, I am gonna die. And the bad part about it is I had repeated it the next day because I hadn't gone to the bathroom. I had just eaten another eight kiwis and then I went to the bathroom. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to happen again tomorrow. <laughs> it's, too... <laughs> it's too late. So number one, you can do too much of a good thing. That's the, when you eat, holistic or not. And so that was the lesson learned there is like, slow your roll. You can't overdo, you can overdo healthy stuff. So, um, but so number one, it's like, there's that I learned with holistic healing. There are thousands of ways to heal. There is no one right way. There is no one right way. And a lot of supplements and foods are redundant in what they do. So you don't have to take them all. You don't have to take all the juices. You don't have to take all the supplements. You have to figure out what you need, um, which is what I did. So for me, after, you know, I got like two ultrasound scans that were nothing changed. Um, I decided I was gonna kind of take a a different approach. And number one, I said, I'm gonna stop stressing so much about it. I also changed doctors at that point because the doctor I had gone to became very negative about it and was so discouraging. I'd almost be in tears leaving that office. So I said, I'm getting somebody else who can be more positive about what I'm doing. It's number one, it's okay to fire your doctors if they're not treating you how you need to be treated. Number two, um, I said, I'm gonna take a break from all the research and just, chill out. And that's when it came to me on what to do. I was on a beach. I'd gone for a vacation. I hadn't gone in forever on a beach in Mexico where nobody was off season. So literally I was the only person on the beach and I was sitting there. It was beautiful. And I was just relaxing. I had my guacamole and I was just sitting there and it came to me that I was doing way too much and that I needed to narrow this down. And the plan just kind of came to me, you know? And I would say that's kind of like, you know, 
the Holy Spirit, the, your gut instinct, whatever you want to call that, that's what happened. When you sit down and be quiet, you get that download. And so so when I got back home, I decided, okay, I'm, I'm going to just break this up into three categories. We need to support the immune system because the immune system is what does the work regardless. That's what does the work. So let's support the immune system, make sure that I'm getting all the vitamins and nutrients I need. So the immune system is empowered to do what it needs to do. Then the second one was let's reduce you know, inflammation because inflammation is a, is a problem with most illnesses. Um, and so let's do things um, that reduce inflammation. And then the third thing was, well, let's also do things that fight cancer specifically. So I was like, there's three categories of things that I need. Some of them overlap. I'm going to choose two or three in each category and not have like 20 that I'm doing um, and narrow it down. I was like, this makes the most sense based on all the research that I've done and had done up to that point. It just made sense. Um, and then once I got the food and the, the supplements down, I was able to then focus on the emotional piece of it because a lot of illnesses show up due to stress, due to unresolved issues, due to current living conditions, due, due to childhood traumas, due to current traumas, due to being feeling stuck in bad relationships, not speaking up for yourself, being taken advantage of, all these things. So I was like, this needs to be a holistic approach. And that's what the naturopathic doctor helped me uncover as well. And so, so that's, that's kind of where I got to. Wow. That, that's amazing that you, well, first of all, you know, I guess the, the relaxation, the stepping away, the coming away allowed your mind to maybe assimilate all the things you had been learning. Mm -hmm. Cause it, cause it wasn't until that when you're like, Oh, right. here are these things I need right. to do. Before that, it was just, I was just taking a bunch of things. I was right. I had to keep a schedule of, cause there's so many things that I was doing and it was overwhelming. It was actually stressful in itself. So yeah, right. so stepping away definitely gave me the opportunity to say, like I said, for everything to crystallize. Right, right. Now I want to talk about those three components that you said, but before that, the stress, the stress, the stress. Mm -hmm. We underestimate the impact of stress in our lives. Um, when you, when you talked to your, your physicians with the diagnosis, did they seem to indicate what they thought had caused your cancer? No, they said they really couldn't say they were like sometimes excess, you know, um, radiation in the thyroid area, like, uh, excess dental x-rays and things like that, or some environmental factor. So, um, unknown environmental factors. So I had had a lot of dental x-rays. I feel like I had gone to a dentist who looked at my insurance, was like, oh, she's got great insurance. Let's do a bunch of unnecessary things. So I had a lot of, um, you know, unnecessary dental x-rays. So I thought that might have been part of it. Um, but I wasn't at the first half of it determined to figure out why I had it. So I did investigate a lot of, okay, what could it have been? Um, and I did go to um, a laboratory that tests for radiation because the lab that I, that was for employees of the lab where I work, because there are instances where we will be, you know, exposed to that. So, so I went to this lab to get tested and um, I did come up with a high level of Californium, which isn't normal and is like radioactive to a con extent. And so I felt like that was probably why I had it. And that was a good enough answer for me to, to be satisfied that, that was probably it. So now I need to just focus on detoxing from radiation. And so that's when I started doing the baths and the bentonite clay and taking uh, the mushroom extracts and things that, that protect the thyroid from radiation and things like that. So, so I kind of went through that regimen after that and I said, I feel like I need to let that part go and focus on the healing and not focus on why do I have this? And looking back, I understand now because I'm a believer in how we feel and how we think and the energy we're putting out 
affects the healing. And so if I'm still kind of like, why did I get this? Why did I get this? I got it. That's a different energy from the healing energy. So I was like, I got to shift over to that. And that's, that's what I did there. All right. And so you, you talked about those three components. So the immune system, mm -hmm. the inflammation and mm -hmm. things specifically for cancer. Mm -hmm. How do those things show up now in what you do? How do those three things that came about as a result of your treating yourself? Yeah, so I still follow that ideology just to a much looser extent, you know, because it's a, it was very strict during the the cancer, you know, recovery phase. Um, but I still do things that reduce inflammation, like I take omega three fatty acids, the DHA, because that helps reduce inflammation. It's also good for your brain health is necessary. Um, but I make sure I take it in addition to just eating things that have omegas like chia seeds and flax seeds and those kind of things. I, I take that. Um, I eat a high raw diet. So I'm always looking at what am I eating green? How many fruits am I eating a day? So I, I do like smoothies most days because I put the greens and I put the fruit and I put a bunch of good supplements, green powders, all kinds of stuff in the smoothie. So I feel like it's like my mega multivitamin. Um, so I make sure I'm like nourishing my body with those kind of foods all the time. And then I'm always going to eat raw foods because you need to eat a high raw diet. Um, you know, I might eat a little junk food here, potato chips here or there, but it's not my norm. It's what I'm going to balance out, you know, tomorrow with not eating anything like that and eating more healthy. Um, and focusing on the healthy, you know, proteins and things. So, um, yeah, and then occasionally I'll do cleanses just to make sure everything's good, especially if I've been traveling or been way off track. I mean, let's, let's kind of bring it back in and get back on track. Right, right. So, so we've been spending time talking about the cancer, right? But make this a little general for us, for people who may not have cancer right now, Mm -hmm. People who are sitting, who are watching that are thinking, well, do I, do I need to make some changes in, in my life? Um, what do you say to that person? And then secondly, to the person who kn has to make changes, but doesn't know how to make a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's always good to be on the preventative side than the recovery side. Um, the recovery side, you have a lot of motivation. So sometimes it makes it easier to implement because you're like, my life is on the line, but it also brings stress with it of like, I hope this works. I hope, you know, I got to get well, I got to get well. So it's better to be on the preventative side where you're just living life. And let me add this healthy, let me make some changes here. Let me prevent the hypertension. Let me prevent diabetes. Let me prevent cancer for me because we all have cancer cells in our body. It's just whether your immune system is up to the task of taking care of those and taking them out. So what you want to do to be on the preventative side is make sure you're eating a high fiber diet. Most of the standard American diet is very low in fiber because all the processed food has removed the fiber. And I think intentionally um, from the food. And so you're, you're, you're not eliminating as often as you should and as bulky as you should. And that elimination is what takes out the free radicals, which are the things that cause the damage to the DNA. So when you're eating a high fiber, high fruit, high vegetable diet, you're taking those free radicals out. So for anybody, regardless of where you are, if you're eating a low fruit and vegetable diet and a high processed food, white flour diet, that's eventually catches up with you. So you want to start now by making those changes, by adding smoothies by adding oats by adding you know vegetables and making vegetables the centerpiece trying plant-based recipes so that you're not eating meat every day three times a day you know that's just a setup because the science says that's not the direction you want to go um and all the healing properties of food are in the vegetables and the fruit that's what i found in my research and i was not like looking for a specific answer. I was looking for any answer when it came to how to heal. So it wasn't an agenda. It was the agenda was healing. So if it said drink milk three times a day to get rid of cancer, I would have done that. 
but it didn't say that. The research said the opposite. It said get rid of inflammation forming foods like milk, like cheese. Um, and so while you know you might be healthy right now, um, things, cancer and things take years to manifest. So you just wanna make the changes now before that happens. And a lot of us aren't going to the doctor and getting blood work and all that anyway. So something could be creeping up and you don't even know it. So you could really just want to get in front of it um, because the benefits are huge. It's not just, oh, I won't get cancer. It's, oh, I'm more alert. I feel younger. I feel I recover faster. I, you know, I don't have arthritis. It's, it's, there's so many benefits to it immediately that you don't have to wait, you know, that the only benefit you get out of it is you don't get cancer, but that's a big benefit too. Right, right. Wow. So, so talk to us a little bit about veganism, right? Now you, you were involved in what the health, the movie, Mm -hmm. uh, great movie, by the way. (laughs) Um, so there are people out there and I see them in our office, uh, who come in and they say, well, doc, you know, I've been eating like this. My mama's been eating like this. My grandmama, this is how we've been eating. I can't, I, I can't do it. I can't. What do you say to that person? You can. Every, every person who's vegan almost that I know, including myself, said those very words. I can't do it. Um, I remember when a friend of mine a long time ago, around, you know, 2005, 2006, gone vegan. And I did the hardest eye roll ever. Like, that's so extreme. We don't need to do that. I was like, we don't kill the cow to get the milk. So there's not that ethical issue. I don't understand. I was like, you can't eat anything. You can't have potato salad. You can't have mac and cheese. You can't have cake. You can't, everything that normally has milk and cheese in it. I'm like, that's too far. You know, I was like, this is just ridiculous. What are you trying to prove? So I've been there. So everybody who's gone vegan pretty much has said the exact same thing until you start getting into it and realizing how easy it is to make those substitutes. And and in most cases, it tastes better the plant-based way. Um, And so there are so many substitutes now to help people make the transition that there's really no excuse. Anybody can do it. It just sounds extreme until you start. And then everyone that I've coached through it has come back and said, it was way easier than I thought it was going to be. So so just know you're in good company if you feel like you can't do it because everybody says that. Everybody says that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's take a look here. So we've got some folks. So uh, let's see. Grace is saying hello. She says, hello, Dr. Wood and Dr. Lathan. Glad to be here. Thanks for coming through, Grace. And then Florence said, uh, let's see. She says that you, you're such a brave woman, Dr. Lathan. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you, Florence. Thank you for coming by. Uh, we've been having an amazing conversation with Dr. Ruby Lathan about uh, her history, her her life, really, as she uh, pivots into nutrition. And and so what I want you to do now, Dr. Lathan, is just take a moment and tell people if they're interested in connecting with you, following you, uh, engaging you, how can they reach out to you? Let's uh, pop that on the screen here now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, my website is the most common way. Um, you can uh, reach me there, see what's going on. You can access a number of things. Um, obviously, I do coaching, but I also created a, a cancer recovery course. Um, that's me, vi- a video course that walks you through it because I can't coach everybody. So that course is there um, that you can take on demand and have access to that information. Um, and then I also created a how to get out of the life you created course. And we can talk about that because a lot of people were like me, like not knowing how to get out of something, um, even though it's good, it's not really where you want to be. So I created that course there too, but I'm on all social media. Um, you can reach out to me there, um, email, um, make appointments through my website. And my website has a ton of information, videos on healthy cooking, recipes, all of that. So I'd start there and then from there, uh, reach out in terms of what you need help with. If you're dealing with cancer or trying to change your life, take the courses. And if you want that one-on-one, then I'm available for most people to do that also. 
Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Well, are there any final words for people as they're watching those who are here now, those who are watching the replay, um, holistic medicine, nutrition, lifestyle, any tips or tricks you can give us as we head out? I'd say if you're really trying to get into a healthier diet, start with one thing that you're going to change. Um, Cold turkey often doesn't work for people if you don't have a plan of what you're going to do. Instead, I've seen a lot of people fail with that because they just ate like peanut butter and salad and they didn't know what else to eat. So you got to get a plan of what you're going to eat instead. So start with, you know, small changes like adding smoothies instead of an egg McMuffin for breakfast or instead of that latte, you know, you're drinking vegetables and fruit instead. So make the changes small and keep a plan. And if you're dealing with some illness, get help with that. Find someone who's been there and that can coach you through it because it can be overwhelming and having that support system is really important. Well, Dr. Lathan, thank you so much. This has been an amazing conversation, the wealth of information. I hope you will allow us to bring you back and because uh, we barely <laughs> touched the surface of all the stuff that we possibly could have talked about. Absolutely. I'd love to come back and I appreciate you having me on. Sure, sure, sure. So if you would hang on for a minute and we'll uh, close out and then we'll be back. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, folks, yeah, you heard it. Amazing conversation. Health is wealth. And uh, we've got to stay healthy. Dr. Rain and Andrews talked uh, earlier about making sure that you are seeing your physician. Um, here, here's an example of taking charge of your health and taking charge of your life, creating the life you want. And it starts with making sure that you are looking at your body, looking at your health holistically. Um, you know, we've talked here about sleep and stress. And here Dr. Lathan is talking about how do we use food as medicine? And once you know what I heard what I said, how do we use food as medicine? And some of the changes that we make may seem like they are huge and extreme and things that we can't do. But preparation, right, preparation for and having a plan is so important as we head into our life. Well, let's hop over for a minute and let's do our amazing uh, question wheel. And uh, let's see. Let's get over there. If you've been here before. All right, so if you've been here, you know about our question wheel. If you haven't, this is what it is. You see a wheel on the screen that has some questions. If you would like your question to show up on the wheel, go ahead and send those in and you can see. You'll, you'll see those right here. Uh, Dwayne Wood MD, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. And you can even send that to our email address, dwood at dwaynewoodmd.com. And we'll give you a shout out if your question uh, makes it to the wheel. And here are the rules for the wheel. Uh, I will spin. I will spin the wheel. And uh, whatever question it lands on, I'm answer. And I've got to give a, a concise, usable, practical answer. And I've got to do it in 45 seconds. What we'll do is we'll clip that out. We'll make a reel. We'll make a short, whatever it calls on the platforms. And then when you find it out there, I want you to put hashtag I was there, right? Hashtag I was there because you saw me create it here on the screen. So let's go ahead and let's spin the wheel and let's see what question we're going to answer tonight. Round and round and round it goes where it stops. I don't know. <laughs> I got to get a different thing that I say for that, right? Yeah, I know. If you have something, <laughs> let me know. All right. So how do I know? How do I know if I have PCOS? How do I know if I have PCOS? So PCOS polycystic ovarian syndrome, polycystic ovarian syndrome. And let's see, 45 seconds. What can I say in 45 seconds about PCOS? Here we go. How do I know if I have PCOS? Okay. 45 seconds on the screen. How do I know if I have PCOS? Well, PCOS is a diagnosis that comes with certain characteristics and they are these one an annual over <laughs> annual <laughs> see all right so that's my 45 seconds that's gone that's gone 
Right. So menstrual cycles that are um, not regular, right? So as a matter of fact, you can uh, be missing up to three menstrual cycles a year. Uh, increased testosterone. So people who have hirsutism, so increased hair growth and polycystic ovaries. So those are the three criteria that are usually made by the physician. Those are the ways that you will know that you have polycystic ovarian syndrome. <laughs> See, there you go, right? Right. So live and on, uh, yeah, live and uncut. <laughs> so we'll see how that one turns out. Yeah, look at that one for specifically. Yeah, I want you guys to find that one on the on on our platforms and put high uh, hashtag I was there because you saw me do it live here on the show. All right. So thank you for being here, guys. We're still in Vlogmas, right? So Vlogmas, once again, content creators that are out there who are improving, who are expanding, who are growing. Our channel, my channel this month, we are featuring, we're highlighting people who are doing things in their space. And you do not want to miss any of the episodes that's coming up for this week. We've got uh, Dr. Oriaku who's coming through. We've got India Delgado. We've got Pastor Kirk Nugent and Dr. Neil Barnard who are going to be here. And we've heard this week so far from uh, Dr. Raynan Andrews, Dr. Ruby Lathan. And last night, if you missed the episode that I did, how to fail into success, how to fail into success. Thank you for being here. This is Dr. Dwayne Wood. That's Wood with an E. The E stands for endocrinology. And I want you to go out and make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you've not already done so. If you don't have an account, you can create a free account, hit the subscription uh, notification, sorry, subscription button and the notification bell so that you get notified when we go live and we put new content up. I, on the channel, I help to educate, empower, and encourage you to take charge of your life, your health, avoid complications, and create the life you've always wanted going to the next level. Thanks for being here. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.